Okay, everyone, here is a um, overview of the, let me just make it a little bit bigger, of the study guide um, so that anybody who doesn't make it to class doesn't have to watch the whole video or because my internet has been so spotty. Uh, we've had a lot of storms in Las Vegas. Apparently it's the um, last, you know, it, the last monsoon was in 2012. The one before that was 1999. We'd have days of rain and thunder in the evenings, which has knocked out power, has uh, made internet either unavailable or knocked out. So while I have internet, I'm going to make this just in case I am not able to go over it when it comes time for class. Because for some weird reason, we get the thunder and the lightning um, and all the rain uh, in the evening hours, um, usually starting around 6 or, or 7 or, uh, p.m. So um, if you haven't heard that news, uh, I've had friends say, hey, we hope you're okay uh, with all that flooding and, and rain going on there. But anyway, enough of that. Question one is from chapter 10. Uh, question one, I ask you to explain fully the functionalist, the conflict, uh, and symbolic interactionist perspectives regarding education. Now here, what I really want you to focus, um, remember, is on education. So this is focused on chapter 10. Some of them, from a functionalist perspective, uh, remember that education is viewed as uh, beneficial. Uh, it serves a purpose for society. And of course, some of the functions that education serves as outlined in the text, um, and I was going to start going over last week, uh, are things such as um, we learn math, we learn how to read, we uh, learn history, geography, you know, all these uh, math, arithmetic, all these subjects that will help us to become contributing members of society uh, when we grow up. And of course, along the way, schools also teach us the norms and the values of our society. Schools also help to socialize us. So we learn how to make friends, how to keep friends. We learn how to work with people who are different from ourselves, get along with people who are different from ourselves, etc. cetera. Um, so from a functionalist perspective, lots of positive things going on there. From a conflict perspective, the conflict perspective, remember, is focused on what's not working so well. Um, and for sure here, um, conflict perspective evaluating education is looking at some of the things that are problematic within, uh, within uh, education and particularly uh, through the K, in the K through 12 levels. So hidden curriculum, um, I believe is in the text, it's cultural imperialism that is not. Hidden curriculum is this idea that there are many things that are taught in schools that have nothing to do with learning. Um, they have more to do with teaching us the norms and the values of society, which from a conflict perspective, um, often have nothing to do with making us a better informed person, but rather making us more willing, more likely to embrace the attitudes of um, the society around us. And so here's a quick example. Uh, in California, uh, the curriculum is fairly, uh, one could say, progressive, very inclusive. Um, however, in many southern states, there are currently laws that have been passed or are in the process of being passed in which students um, are being prevented from getting information. Um, so one of those that um, most popular bills being passed right now, I believe it started in Florida and it's being passed in other states or currently uh, is law in those states. Um, they're loosely being called the don't, gay say, don't say gay laws. Um, so no talk about um, gender identity, sexual orientation, any, none of that uh, can be discussed. Now, Children may have questions about these things. Um, no one is suggesting that there is a whole module or um, uh, training manual on these subjects, but rather that if these conversations happen in an organic way, meaning you know they just arise because uh, a child maybe sees a couple um, and asks the teacher, "Hey, you know, I, I noticed that that." 
classmate has uh, two fathers, or I notice that that other classmate has two mothers. Uh, what's you know what's that about? What's going on? Um, a teacher can't address that question under these laws, whereas in California, a teacher can. Um, so that's just one example of hidden curriculum. But here's another one that probably most people can agree is, because not everybody would agree that the Southern state laws are not a good thing. Um, some would actually say, yes, they're a great thing. I, I agree with it. California should have it too, which is fine. We don't have to agree uh, on anything. But just you know, be aware that there are two ways to look at the same issue. Um, and then hidden curriculum could also another example could also be uh, one in which, um, for example, we are in Nazi Germany. Um, children were being told um, that people who were not white and Aryan and Protestant uh, were inferior. And so believing in that, or I mean, we could even point to the United States. Through much of the 20th century, children were taught by both their parents as well as schools that black children and other children of color were inferior, um, that white children were smarter um, than, than they were. And therefore, those other children were inferior. That's why they had to go to separate schools or be in separate classrooms. So um, those are examples of hidden curriculum. And then cultural imperialism. Cultural imperialism is this idea that the culture of the dominant group is used as the standard by which children, all children are measured, even if they don't come from that dominant group standard. Um, and certainly, you know, some things we want all children to be able to do. You know, we all want everyone, quote, to be able to speak proper English, for sure. Um, however, for a quite a long time in throughout the United States, other languages, second languages that a child might speak uh, were viewed as inferior and children were uh, punished um, if they spoke them in school. Um, and the message was very clear, English is the better language, English is the best language, you don't need those other languages. So those are the kinds of messages perhaps that children will sometimes get, you know, that the United States is the best uh, country in the world. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate about whether that's true. Um, it's a great country, that's for sure. I'm glad I was born here, um, no doubt about that. Um, but can we learn from other countries? I think so. Um, but again, not everybody agrees uh, that the United States is not the best country in the world. Uh, again, I'm not saying I wasn't born to, glad to be born here. Of course I was. Um, but I don't think that means that we can't also be critical about things that don't work very well, particularly in education and how white dominant culture is used as the standard to measure everything else by. You know, there's a lot of value in the cultures of all people here in the United States. Um, at least I believe so. Symbolic interactionist perspective, focusing on education. Remember that symbolic interactionist perspective is really focused on the interactions that happen in schools. And uh, here, you'd really want to make sure that you talk about Pygmalion effect, which is discussed in the chapter. And Pygmalion effect is focused on the idea that teachers interact with their children uh, in such a way that without being aware of it, they can either encourage students to achieve or they can discourage children uh, from achieving. Um, and so the way that a teacher interacts with the students will have an influence, an impact on how that child feels in school, how they learn, whether they learn as they should or whether they're discouraged from learning and perhaps uh, come to believe that they're big dummies. Um, so you wanna make sure that you discuss Pygmalion effect there. All right, and of course, in any any discussion that you, that you um, read, you wanna make sure you're getting examples um, and detail to support your statements. Don't just say, functionalist theorists say that education is good for society. That's true, but how, in what ways, explain that. Um, which perspective do you believe best describes what's happening in school today and why? So you may think it's all three of them. 
You may think it's functionalist and symbolic. You may think it's conflict and symbolic. You may think it's only one of them. You don't have to only choose one. Um, you could tell me that you think there's a little bit of all three or just these two. But again, tell me why you reached that conclusion. How did you reach that conclusion? What are the examples that you're relying upon to come to that conclusion? And then finally, explain homeschooling, vouchers, distance learning, and charter schools. Those are all discussed in the text, so um, I won't go over them in a lot of detail here because I think there's a really good discussion uh, in the text. Um, in your opinion, do any of these offer better educational opportunities than traditional public schools? So after you've explained them, think about, do you think any of these offer better traditional, uh, better educational opportunities than traditional public schools. If you think one or more do, fine, tell me why. If you think none of them do, fine, tell me why. Um, just make sure you're explaining how you reach your conclusion. Remember, that's always the important part in an essay. All right, so question number two, chapter eight. Um, explain prejudice and discrimination and give examples of how these two concepts still exist in the U.S. today. Discuss how the functionalist conflict and symbolic interactionist perspectives view racial and ethnic stratification. Explain institutional discrimination and give examples of how it used to be used widely and how it may still exist in the U.S. Discuss how the intersectionality of your personal characteristics have, has influenced or shaped your experiences here in the US. And I ask you to give at least two examples here. So prejudice, it is, um, as hopefully you either watched the video or you, you read the chapter in, in great detail, prejudice is uh, emotional it's, it, and, and it's cognitive. It's how we think and feel. Um, and prejudice, we can be positively prejudiced toward our own group, but we typically think of it as the negative prejudice, where we have these biased, negative opinions of people without really knowing who they are. Um, and a good example of prejudice is um, how many of our state laws up until the 1965 Civil Rights Act um, prohibited black people um, from going to colleges and universities in many southern states, or how uh, even now, up until 2015, same-sex marriage uh, was not uh, viewed as uh, something that should be allowed. So people had prejudice against people who were same-sex couples and didn't believe um, that these couples were legitimate. The discrimination is action. Discrimination is intentional negative action towards someone because of their status. And one thing to remember about prejudice and discrimination is it isn't just about skin color. We tend to think this prejudice and discrimination are about race and ethnicity, but really these two things can be targeted at any group, um, not just people who are in same-sex relations with members of the GLBTQ community or non-gender or non-conforming individuals or non-binary uh, people, but also toward people who are overweight, people who are disabled, people who are um, you know, viewed as very unattractive, people who are viewed as very dumb. You know, we're humans. We can be prejudiced against almost anyone uh, or anything. Um, it doesn't, doesn't take us too much to be jerks. Um, so give examples, at least, at least uh, a couple examples, two examples. Examples is plural, meaning at least two. So two of prejudice, two of discrimination. Discuss how the functionalist conflict and symbolic interactionist perspectives view racial and ethnic stratification. Okay, so um, again, thinking about the functionalist perspective, looking at or their, the analysis of racial and ethnic stratification. Well, it may not be surprising, or it may be surprising to you, to learn, if you read the text or again you watched the video that I provided for this chapter, the functionalist theorists believe that um, there, is some po there are some positive things that come out of um, the racial and ethnic identities that, that people have. 
um, that it, it promotes uh, a lot of um, solidarity, a lot of unity, um, and social support within groups. Um, however, even functionalist theorists recognize that the classifications of race and ethnic ethnicity can be negative if they are used to classify people in an inferior way or to subordinate or subjugate people such that they don't have the same rights or opportunities as others in society. But on the face of it, racial and ethnic classifications uh, are positive because of that solidarity, the unity, the social support that people within groups may have. Conflict uh, perspective, of course, looking at racial and ethnic stratification, um, of course, has got a whole slew of the history in the United States as well as around the world of how race and ethnicity have been used in negative ways or have been used to classify people in negative ways so that they are unable um, to access the same opportunities and rights as others. Um, and so, you know, we can think here, in, at least in the United States, of slavery early on, then segregation. Um, and of course, uh, even though the 1964 Civil Rights Act uh, and the 1965 Voting Rights Act were signed into law in those years, that doesn't mean that there isn't still uh, some classification, in, in, in my view, one of the classifications today that um, is viewed quite negatively are immigrants, particularly immigrants who are brown immigrants, whether they're from Mexico or Central America. Um, typically, people think of brown immigrants in a, in a negative way, whereas they may not think of immigrants from Europe or Canada or Australia uh, in a negative way. And then symbolic interactionist perspective. Symbolic interactionist perspective is focused on um, how we interpret or, or how we uh, give meaning to race and ethnicity and how, because of the perceptions we have, um, given our biases of people who are different from ourselves, we may then interact in ways that are different. So think about how Again, this is in the past, but it still does happen from time to time. Well, one example is the more recent um, instances of um, hate crimes against Asians. Um, if you maybe you weren't paying attention to the news, but uh, in 2020, 21 in particular, there were quite a few uh, media uh, stories about uh, Asians who were attacked by someone who uh, blamed them for COVID. Um, in fact, not only were some of these individuals attacked, some of them died as a result of their injuries. And of course, there have also been uh, some more recent, again, within the last couple years, instances uh, on the East Coast of individuals who have targeted synagogues um, while Jewish people were um, at, at their um, service. Um, and then, of course, um, back in 2016, a young man by the name of Dylan Roof uh, went to a black church in the South. He had driven from his home a couple hundred miles to go to a black church. Uh, there, he went into a church. There was a Bible study uh, going on. The 14, 15 members who were at that study uh, or that Bible study group invited him in. Um, he sat with them for some period of time, I forget how much, maybe half an hour, 40 minutes, something like that, studying the Bible with them. Um, and then he opened fire and he killed several of them. Um, several of them died and, and others were, were injured. Um, and so we know that the way that we perceive others, the way that we attach meanings to their race or their ethnicity may influence the way that we interact with those individuals. Um, then explain institutional discrimination and give examples of how it used to be used widely and how it may still exist in the U.S. Okay, so institutional discrimination. The first part of that answer is focused on individual discrimination. 
All right, so prejudice, discrimination, individually, we can have prejudices against someone. We can discriminate against that person. Maybe we own a store and we tell that person we're out of stock, something they want, or we um, are renting a house or an apartment and we don't rent to somebody because we don't like, quote, their kind. There are ways for individuals to discriminate. Um, somebody who has a small store and is hiring, maybe doesn't hire somebody from a particular uh, racial or ethnic group. Um, but institutional discrimination is this idea that, inst that discrimination is built into um, the institutions, meaning that the institution regulations or guidelines or the way it was created was built on a white mainstream uh, model. Um, and the institution perhaps is not willing or able to engage with or to include others. Um, and as I said, there are plenty of examples of this um, up, you know, throughout to the 1960s and even into the early 1970s with educational institutions not allowing people of color to attend them, uh, with women not being allowed to um, go to certain colleges or practice certain professions. Um, and so that kind of institutional discrimination, or here's another one, um, in the military up until 1942 or 44, somewhere around there until an executive order was signed, uh, people of color, men of color, when they joined the military, they served in separate platoons from white soldiers. Um, so. Uh, they weren't considered good enough to serve alongside white soldiers, even though some of these ethnic platoons did some phenomenal work uh, in helping the United States government to um, win World War II. I'm talking here about the Wind Talkers, a group of Navajo um, uh, indigenous persons who used their native language to be able to send uh, and receive messages from one place to another uh, without the Germans or the Japanese being able to decipher them because very few people know the Diné language. Um, or the um, Tuskegee Airmen who flew air missions that were very successful. Um, they were black men who had never been given a chance to fly and they proved themselves to be quite phenomenal airmen. So. There are some examples of how it used to be used widely. Yeah, there's no shortage of, of finding them, so give at least two. Um, and then how might it still exist in the US? Well, um, you know, that may be a little harder to find, but I would say some more recent examples again are um, same-sex marriage was outlawed until 2015. Um, it's a little bit harder. Oh, and of course, um, GLBTQ individuals were not allowed to join the military until 2013. Um, that's a big one. Um, so, and, and maybe you can't think of any, I just gave you a couple that were more recent, but maybe you can't think of any today. Um, and that's okay, just tell me, you know, why you don't see it or you know, where you think it might exist, but you're, you're not sure. Um, discuss the intersectionality of your personal characteristics. How has the, the intersectionality of your personal characteristics influenced or shaped your experiences in the U.S.? Um, in the text, um, there's a discussion, and I discussed it too in that first lecture that I was able to do. Um, intersectionality is how we have several characteristics, personal characteristics, maybe race, maybe ethnicity, maybe gender, maybe sexuality, um, maybe um, intelligence, etc. We have personal characteristics. Uh, maybe we're athletic, you know, whatever it might be, artistic, whatever. And how does, the, how does the intersection of all of these things that you are, these personal characteristics, how do they shape or influence who, what you experience in the U.S.? Because we're all different. We're all unique individuals. We don't experience the U.S. Uh, American society in the same way. And I think it's important for us to recognize that. We are not all the same. We are each unique individuals. And though you may not experience something that a classmate does, that doesn't mean that just because you don't experience it, your classmate's experience is any less important. I think it's important for us to keep that in mind. 
Question number three is from chapter six, explain in detail the three perspectives on deviance, the functionalist, the conflict, and symbolic interactionist, um, and make certain to discuss at least one theory for each perspective. Explain the concept of rehabilitation in the criminal justice system and discuss how it is used in Scandinavia. Do you think that this type of system could work in the US? Why or why not? Okay, so again, here, I'm asking you to consider um, focusing on deviance uh, as we discussed it in chapter six. So those three perspectives from a functionalist perspective, remember there are three potentially positive things that Durkheim pointed out can happen. So make sure you discuss those three. From a conflict perspective, um, remember that there's a focus on how people who have power tend to define crime um, in a way that is beneficial to them, but disadvantageous to others. And then from a symbolic interactionist perspective, remember thinking about how we think of people who have been convicted of a crime and how we interact with them, how we treat them, um, and how knowing a label like, you know, ex-con or ex-felon, ex etc., may shape the way that we interact with that person. Um, and then for theories, there are two theories. Uh, choose one. You can discuss from a functionalist perspective. You can choose uh, Merton's theory, um, you know, Robert Merton's structural functionalist theory, um, or you could choose, uh -huh, I'm blanking on the other one right now. There was one more that we discussed. Oh, control theory. Control theory. So choose one of those, discuss it. And don't just say control theory says this. Talk about the theory. Explain it. Um, conflict perspective. There is no um, theory discussed, particular to theory discussed, so just give an example for that one. Um, you know, how, does, how do conflict theorists analyze society in terms of deviant behavior and crime? How is it, how is uh, people in power, how are they using their power to define crime, etc., or to get out of crime? Um, symbolic interactionist perspective, uh, there is, uh, I think there are three, if I remember correctly. Differential association theory is one you could choose. You could choose labeling theory. I think there might be one other, but I'm blanking on it right now. But just choose one of them and explain uh, the theory. Um, explain the concept of rehabilitation in the criminal justice system and discuss how it's used in Scandinavia. Now, I will admit that these page numbers are from the um, seventh edition of the textbook. I don't have the eighth yet. I just asked the publisher to send it to me. So if you have the eighth edition, just look in chapter seven and look for the discussion in Scandinavia. And I'll try to remember right after this to put uh, a clip into the module for chapter six that um, focuses on um, Norwegian prison, prisons and how differently they do things. Um, and so how is it used? rehabilitation in Scandinavian criminal justice system. And then think about, could we do that here? Could we do something like that here? Do you think it would work? Why or why not? Um, question number four, excuse me, I'll get a little bit of water here. <coughs> question number four, I'm asking you to discuss in detail the three theories of population change. This is chapter 15. Um, and explain which one of these theories you think best explains the current situation um, in the U.S. So um, these are, um, uh, hold on a sec. So the three theories are the Malthusian, the anti-Malthusian, and the neo-Malthusian theories of population change. Um, they're explained quite well in the text. Um, and I will go over these two in lecture um, and explain which of these theories you think best explains the current situation in the U.S. Explain how each of these um, three perspectives analyze the natural environment. Okay, so after you've explained those three, which one do you think really is happening? Which one best describes what we're seeing in the U.S. today? Um, and also discuss how each of the perspectives analyzes the natural environment. Um, explain the problems of consumption and pollution and discuss potential solutions for each of these problems. And of course, if you've paid any attention to what's going on in, you know, globally in terms of our climate, as well as um, 
just how we as humans are affecting the planet in very negative ways. One of those problems is that of consumption, um, overconsumption, we might more accurately describe it. Um, as humans, we are so used to buying things and then uh, chucking them, dumping them, throwing them away after a few uses. Um, one of those issues is fast fashion. Uh, it's called fast fashion because it's expected that Consumers will not wear these clothes for very long, maybe two or three wearings or washings, and then they'll get something else. Um, brands that are um, well known for this are things such as H H H and M, um, Zara. You know all these types of fast fashion sorts of things where we know they're not going to last long, but we're okay with that because we know we're going to chuck it, we're going to toss it away. Um, but also. Um, all the disposable things we use every day, from coffee cups, those little K-cups, to straws, to um, bottles and cans and, and napkins, you know, all the things that are, we don't even think about. We go to Starbucks or we go to, you know, McDonald's or wherever, and we buy food or drinks that are in containers that are just going to be used one time and then thrown away. And so that kind of consumption, of course, has created an issue for us worldwide about where do we dump all this stuff. Um, and then, of course, the pollution that comes from all of us wanting to drive the fattest, biggest cars, um, all of us wanting to, um, uh, you know, have um, the newest uh, thing even Bitcoin uh, is a problem because it takes tremendous energy, um, not Bitcoin um, only, but I mean cryptocurrency in general. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to create um, the different. Because um, you know, if you know anything about cryptocurrency, it's really about different unique codes that are created by computers, um, and of course, every person has their own unique code. Um, and so all of this energy, excuse me, sorry, I had to sneeze there. Um, all of this energy that is used to create this virtual money, essentially. Um, and so there are a number of problems um, that are discussed and then also solutions for each of these. Um, and then after you read the box on page 443, which is about the environmental solutions that we can all engage in, which ones do you already engage in and what could you add? Are there any ideas that um, are not in the text that you do or that you read about and have thought about doing? And if you don't do anything to reduce environmental damage, um, explain why not and um, support your lack of action. You know, what, why do you think that that's okay? Um, I'm interested to hear that. Um, and then finally, question number five, is about chapter or is based on chapter 12. Here four perspectives on marriage and family and they are of course functionalist, conflict, symbolic interactionist but also feminist perspective in this chapter. Um, and so again these four are discussed quite well. I went over them in the um, overview that I put into chapter 12 and just in case when I have to do the lecture uh, I'm not able to because of my internet connection, um, you can watch that video that goes in detail over those perspectives. Um, but it is discussed quite well in the text as well. Um, by the way, that video is already in the module for chapter 12. Um, it's one that I've made before for um, other classes. Discuss the four relationship trends as discussed in the text. Okay, And again, all you have to do is look for relationship trends. Um, if you have the 8th edition, it's in there. You just have to look for that heading, Relationship Trends. Um, and so discuss them, explain them, um, and then describe the extent to which gender and sexuality influence the division of labor in families. Okay, so again, gender and sexuality. How do we think about uh, people within the family? How do we think about males? How do we think about females? How do we think about... Um, a child who is non-binary or a child who is gender non-conforming or a child who is cisgender heterosexual or a child who is um, uh, identifies as trans or gay or lesbian or bisexual. How do all of those identities play out in terms of um, how families view children and how labor is divided within families?
So that's the overview. Um, and uh, I hope that it is helpful um, so that you, you get a, a good idea of um, what I want you to focus on. And remember, there are five questions, but you will only be assigned two out of, of these uh, on that final exam.